Alrighty, in this video we're going to talk about how to move a data from a view back into the controller. But the first thing we're actually going to do is get rid of that really obnoxious script on my homepage under posts index that just alerts out hi. That's really annoying and it's going away. Notice how I can just delete the section. Since the section isn't marked as required in the layout, I can just delete it and everything is fine. Okay, so back to the topic on hand. We have a login.cshtml file, and most likely we'll want to present a form on it with a username field and a password field, like what you'd expect on a, well, login form. And we need that data to be posted back into the controller in some way. However, as we know from the diagram that we saw earlier, views do not get access to the controllers. This is a thing that I've seen a lot of people who are new to ASP.NET MVC get confused about, typically people who are more familiar with web forms, because web forms has a bunch of black magic that makes stuff like that sort of kind of possible. ASP.NET MVC, however, does not work like it. There's no way to access the controller from the view. That makes sense, actually. It makes perfect sense. The reason it makes sense is because when we come here and hit refresh, Effectively, what we're doing is we're submitting a request to ASP.NET. ASP.NET is loading up our application. It's looking at our routes. It's identifying which route we're going into. It finds the controller that we're going into and the action. It loads that up. It executes the action, gets the action result, which in this case is a view result. Then it executes the view, gets HTML, then sends that HTML to the browser. And by the time we see this page right here, or let's uh, make this a little bit more topical by looking at the login page, by the time we see this page, um, the controller's gone. The controller's history. There is no more controller. It's been used. It was used to execute a single action. The action was then executed. The HTML was generated. It was sent to the browser. That's it. That's the nature of stateless um, web applications, which, well, the web is stateless, if you know anything about HTTP which is a great thing to learn, by the way. So that brings us back to the question. How do we get data from the view back into the controller? We do it with something called model binding. Model binding is, I, in my opinion, one of the most amazing features of ASP.NET MVC and one of the reasons why I love it so much. Because what it effectively does is it turns the normal gross, messy HTML forms that were so, if you're like a PHP developer that you're used to writing and you have to use magic strings all over the place and all that gross stuff, turns all that stuff into a strongly typed object that gets passed almost as if by magic into our controller action. Now, as we know, it's not actually magic, but in this case, it's good magic. Well, it's not, again, it's not magic, but I mean, if it were magic, it would be good magic, like white magic, like, you know, healing and, and all that fun stuff. Oh, it's it's magic, all right. <laughs> By the way, a uh, side note, uh, you know ASP.NET MVC is open source, right? So anybody watching this can actually download the entire source code for ASP.NET MVC and see how it works. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But anyway, so we need to present a form. So we need some sort of representation of that form in the form <laughs> of a strongly typed object. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to start off with the naive implementation, and then I'm going to make it a little bit better with using uh, strongly typed views, but we'll use weakly typed views for now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new namespace into my project by creating a new folder, and I'm going to call it view models. The reason I'm calling it view models is we are going to be representing the data that views can send back to the controllers with a view model. I'm going to create a view model for every single action in the project. What is the view model? Well, the view model is the contract between the controller and the view. Think of it like a contract, like a contract you would sign for, for a house or something. It's an agreement. It says the controller will provide this data and the view will provide this data and it'll be magical and awesome. But I good, like magical and awesome. But good magic. Yeah. So I'm going to create a class. Um, actually, yeah, I'm just going to create a class, and I'm going to delete it, and you'll understand why. I'm going to create a class called auth. 
and then I'm going to delete the class that was generated. So I just have namespace simple blog dot view models. Why did I do that? Well, it's because remember how I said I want every single action inside of every sing single controller to have a view model. I'm going to create one file that has all of the view models for my controller. So that's why the view model file is called auth, but I'm going to create multiple classes inside of it for every single action. So the name of the class that I'm going to create now is public class auth login. Now, everything that I'm doing right now is not enforced in any way whatsoever by ASP.NET MVC. What you are seeing right now is the result of years of people using ASP.NET MVC and establishing a common practice. Having a view model per action is typically considered by the ASP.NET MVC community to be best practice. It's what I've done for years, and it's worked out just fine. So remember how I said this class represents the contract between the view and the controller. So what goes into it? Well, properties. Lots and lots and lots of properties. Let's put some properties in it. I'm going to say public string username. Sounds about right. It's just going to be an automatic property. And how about a password? Username and password. Now, this is data that is actually going to be sent, not from the controller to the view, but from the view to the controller. And it's also going to be sent from the controller and the view, uh, but we'll see an example of that once we get into strongly typed views. So we have auth login here. How do we use it? Well, we use it in the way that I'm about to show by creating a form on my login page that matches up to the property names on the view model. Sound good? Making sense so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my views and I'm going to go into auth login and I'm going to create an HTML form. Now, this isn't how the form is going to look at the end. That's important. I'm just doing it as simply as possible to, um, to make it clear why we do things a certain way. I'm going to open up a normal HTML form with a method of post, because I'm posting. I'm going to create two inputs both of type text. One will have the name of username. And can you possibly guess what the other one will have a name of? No. <laughs> password? Indeed. <laughs> the other one will have a type of password and a name of password. Finally, we need a submit button. So I'm going to say input type equals submit, value equals login. Now I'm going to recompile by hitting F6 jump back into my page, hit refresh, we'll see we now have a username and password field and a login button. I can type in data here and I can type in data here and I can hit it, login and what happens? Well, uh, I, well nothing. nothing because we haven't told it to do anything with the data yet. But actually not exactly nothing. If we open up our developer tools, we'll notice um, and resubmit so it shows up in network. We'll notice that we actually did perform a post operation to the server to this route. And if we look at the data inside of it, we'll see that we have two bits of form data, one username and one password. Now there is a way inside of ASP.NET MVC for the model binder to examine the form data and match these names to actual properties. What we'll get back is an instantiation of our auth login view model with these properties filled out with whatever the browser sent the server, being username and password. And remember, the only reason that happened was because I resubmitted the form. I mean, if I just came back here, notice how when we just click on the login link, we have a get request, right? And if, gotcha. we, look at, if we look at the get request, there are no form elements because we didn't submit any. But if I type in test and test and hit login again, we now get a post request with that data. For test and test, yep. So how do we get this data back? Well, we get this data back uh, very easily through a very common, um, well, through the model binder and through the use of a special attribute. I'm actually going to create a new action, but I'm going to call it login. Now, bear with me. This might sound, this might seem a little weird for a second because I'm creating two methods with the same name, but one will have, will take in different parameters. The second overload is going to take in auth login. I'm going to name it form. Then I'm going to click on this to have resharper 
generate a using statement up here on line six, which simply says using simple blog .view models, which simple blog .view models is where the auth login class lives under. Okay, so for now, I'm just going to say return content high, just for now, right? Sounds good. I'm going to hit F6 to rebuild. I'm going to come back to my blog, hit refresh, and we're going to get an error. The error we get is the current request for action login on controller type auth controller is ambiguous between the following action methods. We have login, and then we have another login that takes in our view model. So how do we fix this? Well, we want to be able to have get requests go into this method, and we want to have post requests go to this method. So we do that by giving this method an attribute called HTTP post. That removes the ambiguity. By hitting F6, coming back to the page and refreshing, notice how we now get the view because we're doing a get request. But if I hit log in, we now get high because now we are being routed into the post action. So we have a get action and we have a post action. Working for me so far. All right. So how do we get the data out of the form that was submitted? Well, because I placed a parameter for auth login, the ASP.NET MVC model binder is going to notice that. And it's going to actually instantiate an auth login for me, one of these classes. And it's going to try to stuff as many parameters as it can find into these properties, which means I can say content, hey there, plus form.username. Hit F6, come back to the login page. Remember, I'm doing a get request here, and I'm going to say Nelson Lacay, and then type in test, and hit login. We get, hey there, Nelson Lacay. We have successfully moved data from a form to a controller. That's very nice. Indeed. Well, that's great, but we have a couple problems. We're going to fix those problems now through another technique that we can use and we'll, we will be using for pretty much the entirety of this class. If I go back to login.cshtml, we see that we have pretty much just a, a form that is in no way related to the view model. The only thing that relates this form to the view model is the fact that I happen to use the same names as the properties. That's it. So what I want to do is ASP.NET MVC comes with helpers that allow me to generate form elements from a class, which is incredibly handy. Let's see how that works. Well, the first thing we need to do before we do anything else is we need to make this view strongly typed. How do I do that? Well, I go to the top of the file. This is important. It needs to be at the top of the file. I type in at model, then the model name, which in this case is simple blog dot view models dot auth login. So what have I done? Well, I've strongly typed this view to his, um, to this view model. That means I can now take advantage of quite a few bits of functionality inside of ASP.NET MVC, or Razor specifically, to generate some form fields for me. So I'm going to keep this example up here, but I'm going to write an example above it. That is how we're always going to do forms from here on out. I'm going to say using HTML.beginForm. Then I'm going to say something like, let's do div. Uh, um, HTML dot label for, and I'll do x goes into x dot username. Then I'm going to say HTML dot editor for x goes into x dot username. Then I'm going to open up another div. I'm going to say HTML label for x goes to x dot password. HTML editor for x goes into x dot password. Then I'm going to open up one more div. I'll separate that out a little bit so it looks a little bit cleaner. And I'm going to do input type equals submit value equals login. So what really changed here? Quite a few things. First of all, we're now using the framework to build our form for us by having this using statement up here. 
The form will open on line 7, and the form will close on line 22 because of the curly braces and the nature of the using statement. Next up, we are now generating labels and editors out of strongly typed properties. This is actually really, really cool. Um, I'm going to remove this code now because that is no longer needed, um, simply because it's a more naive implementation. I'm going to save the file. And I'm going to come back here and do another git request to login. What do we get? Well, we get our labels. Uh, the only thing different is we have labels now. But if I right click on this uh, text box and say inspect element, you'll notice that ASP.NET actually inserted an input for me with an ID and a name of username with the type of text. That is sweet. So it did all that for me uh, just because I'm now, instead of writing the HTML manually, I'm saying, hey, you need to go ahead and look at this class right here. You need to figure out what HTML you need to generate in order for it to be posted in a way that the model binder will be able to pick it up later, is essentially what that's saying. That's very cool. And it's not even magic. It's just really cool. Yeah. OK, so next up, so now that we have our, our login um, form pretty much created, there's actually one more really awesome thing about this. Because I'm using the editor for helpers, if I come back here and in my HTTP post, I'm no longer going to return content. Instead, I'm going to return view. However, I'll go ahead and, and hit F6 to recompile. This isn't going to work right. Not yet, right? So I'll type in test and test and test and hit login. And it's automatically populating the form, unfortunately, for me. That's unfortunate because it misses something I wanted to uh, show you guys. Huh. Um, it's re automatically populating the form because it's gathering that data from the, uh, from the model binder. Um, what we can do instead is show an example of how to pass data from our um, controller into our view, which is what I really wanted to demonstrate. So let's say we want to default our our login to, say, username of bleh. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can. And you can do it by passing in an object into view. For views that are strongly typed, remember, strongly typed views are views that have a specific model associated with it, such as a view model, such as auth login. If I pass in an object into this, it'll populate a special property on the strongly typed view called model. Let's go ahead and show that. I'm going to open up auth login, and I'm going to add in a new public string test. I'm calling it test because this is just an example of how model bind or how uh, strongly typed views can work. Then inside of login, I'm going to say the value of test in our model is at model dot test. Notice how, first of all, this model is capitalized. This model is not. Do not get them confused. Your view will break. <laughs> Second of all, you'll notice that the type of this model is our view model, because if I open up auto completion on it, we see our password, our test, and our username. Those are there because we are associating this view with this model. So if I go ahead and hit F6, um, and come back here and hit refresh, we'll see something interesting. So what do you think is going on? Actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. words, words, words. Let's explain what's going on. What's going on is that we are associating our view with a type, but we are not actually sending any data from our controller into our view which means the model property is null. Because the model property is null, accessing the test property will fail. So we want to make sure the model is not null. To do that, we need to pass something into the view function. If I open up our overload list, we see that there is an overload taking an object model. That's going to be the object that's passed into our view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to instantiate a new auth login, 
and I'm going to use object initialization syntax to add a value into test. Now remember F6, come back here, load this again, and check this out. The value of our test, test in our model is, this is my test value set in my controller. So that's how you pass data from your controller into your view. Sound good? It sounds good so far. You'll also notice that if I hit log in, we'll get that same null reference exception error. This is what I wanted to show you guys earlier. <laughs> when we represent a form for whatever purposes inside of our controller, inside of our uh, corresponding post action in our controller, we always want to make sure to pass back the data we acquired into the view. That being said, if I rebuild, if I come back into login and hit login, you'll notice that the value of test in our model is now blank. The reason it's now blank is because the get request didn't populate a form field, meaning when I hit login, this value was lost and was not sent into the post action. So instead what I can do is inside my post action, I can say form dot test equals, this is a value set in my post action. Hit refresh or hit F6, come back here, hit continue. And we now have, this is a value set for my post action. So remember, we get this is the, the test value set in the controller on the get request. And when we log in, we get this is a value set in my post action. That is really awesome. Alrighty, let's move on to data annotations. Before I do, I'm going to remove this test property entirely. So I'm going to delete it from my login uh, actions. I'm going to remove it from my auth login view model and I'm going to take it out of my login.shishtml, including the corresponding p tag. Okay, so going back to the auth control, or sorry, going back to the login.cshtml file, and I'm going to rebuild real fast, F6, because I changed code. Notice a problem. Problem is, is that my password field is no longer a password field. Why isn't my password field a password field? Well, it's because I'm using the editor for extension. The editor for extension looks at the type of the data and displays the appropriate editor. That's why it's called editor for. The problem is, is I never told ASP.NetMVC my password is actually a password. I mean, it's, it knows its name password. I mean, this, this might actually sound funny to you, Steve, because I find that artists, um, artists have a lot of association with names, but computers don't. Okay. You know what I mean? Well, I understand that it understands that you put the word password there, but in a, in essence, it doesn't know what that word means. It, basically, yeah. So we need to describe to the framework that this is a password data. This is password data, and we want the password form field to appear as if it was a password data form field. Gotcha. We do that with data annotations. So. Data annotations are attributes that we apply to our view models to change the behavior of how they appear inside of um, our views, as well as how they are validated against. So I'm going to open up an attribute. I'm going to type in data type. Now data type is a attribute that's provided by system, component model, data annotations. And it's an attribute that takes in a data type enumeration. And we can see all the data types that we can set it to. Everything from HTML to text to date to currency, blah, blah, blah. But here's the one we care about, password. By setting the data type to password, um, I am now going to get a password form field from my editor. Now remember, I changed the CS file. That means I hit F6. Now watch what happens when I type in password. It's now a password. It's a password field. Yep. Yay. OK. So we have this. We have postbacks working. Um, if we wanted to actually perform login stuff um, inside of our login code, 
uh, we would do that right here inside of our post when we get our data. But we have a couple problems. I want to briefly introduce validation. Validation is simply the act of making sure that data is correct before we do any further processing on it. ASP.NET MVC comes with a pretty powerful validation engine built into it that is supported through data annotations as well as helper methods in our views. So how do we take advantage of that? Well, I want to say that a username is required, and I also want to say that a password is required. And if either of these things aren't set by the person submitting the form, I want to show them an error. How do we do that? Well, we add a data annotation. Not surprisingly, the data annotation we add is called required. I'm going to add another data annotation here. Then I'm going to hit F6, go back here, hit login, and this exact same thing happens as before. The reason is, is although we've told ASP.NET MVC that these are required, we didn't actually tell it what to do in the case that it wasn't set. So that's important. Just adding these attributes isn't going to do anything. So how do we do anything with it? The first step is an auth controller. I want to say if not model state dot is valid, return view form, otherwise return content form is valid. So what does that mean? That means if the user posted to this action and the view model did not pass all the validation checks set with our data annotations, then we redisplay the login form to them and immediately stop executing this action. Otherwise, we notify them through a content response that the form is valid. OK? Good so far. Hit F6. If I try to hit login, look what happens. We get the form back. If I make it valid and hit login, we get the form as valid. Now we have a problem. Problem is, we don't actually have any messages that are saying that you did something wrong. Right? Yeah, it's not telling you that, hey, that's not a proper login. Right. So what we can do is we can go into our view and we can add on uh, up on our form, I'm going to say HTML dot validation summary. That is all I have to do. By coming back here and hitting login, we now get a message. The username field is required and the password field is required. If I fill out the username field, that error goes away and now the password field is required. If I fill out the password, hit login, get the form is valid. That's really slick. Yep. There is one more thing that I want to talk about. And that is, how do we add, um, how do we hook into the system that we have right here without going really crazy? <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining that right. Um, how do we hook back into the messages that are we displaying? How do we hook back into the model state so that we can put in our own custom validation? Now, we aren't doing quote, custom validation, unquote, like you would expect it to be. We're not creating a new attribute, which you can do. But instead, we're going to place a little bit of logic inside of our login function or a login method that checks like some arbitrary value of the username against. And if it's not that value, it'll display a message to the user telling them that the username or password is wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if not model state valid, return view form. Then I'm going to say, if form.username does not equal rainbow dash, then say model state dot add model error username, username or password isn't 20% cooler. Return view form. So what we're doing here is we're simulating if we were to, were to actually hit a database, but we're doing it with a simple string check because we don't have a database yet. And then we're adding an error to the username field if it does not equal what we expect it to be and redisplaying the form. So now if I hit F6 and I log in with Nelson, Nelson, 
I now get an error saying username or password isn't 20% cooler. Whereas, especially, I, especially since you put Nels no. Uh, that too. <laughs> but if I put in the correct username and hit enter, the form is valid. Nice. So that's how we add additional checks to our action, mes me um, action results if those checks have to do with some sort of business logic. That being said, it is possible, though out of the scope of this video series, to create additional attributes that are validated against on our properties. Okay, um, I think that just about wraps up everything we wanted to talk about. We talked about how we can create view models that allow us to pass data from our controllers and into our views. They also allow us to pass data from our views into our controllers. So we see an example right here of us passing data from our controller to our view. We see an example of our view here taking advantage of ASP.NET MVC's uh, form helpers. Then we see an example of allowing that same view model to be populated by the result of an HTTP post and allows us to validate against it. I think that wraps everything up. So let's go we ahead do, and commit. We do have one more thing to do. Yep. OK, so I'm going to go into File Status. I'm going to stage all of my changes. And I'm going to hit Commit. And I'm going to say Added Basic Login Form. And I'm going to Commit. And I'm committed. So with that, I think that about wraps everything up. That's awesome.